Okay, hello everyone. Good morning and uh, <laughs> welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. Um, today the circle is being co-hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, Health sorry, and the Indigenous Initiatives at CTLT. Uh, before we proceed, I would just like to take a moment to recognize the efforts of the, of the Indigenous Initiatives team um, and making sure that we can have this space here today and that we're in a circle. It's, it's uh, so wonderful and welcoming for everybody. Um, uh, in addition, their team will be acting to facilitate discussion and questions from the live audience today for everybody that's listening at home. Um, so if there's a disembodied voice at some point on the camera, that's, that's who that is. Um, so yeah, together we are very pleased to welcome Hazel Belkowski. Yes. Yes. Um, to talk to us today about the importance of connecting to land. Before we begin the session, I would like to acknowledge that we are in the traditional, ancestral, unceded and occupied territories of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. Um, a quick reminder to everyone participating today, both in person and um, following at home, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Um, if at any point you feel that you need, please take the time to indulge in some self-care, talk to a friend, an elder, counselor, family member, whoever it is for you. Um, yeah. So. On to team introductions. My name is Cole. I'm from the Chewathil First Nation, and I'll be kind of facilitating the session today. Uh, other Learning Circle team members in the room but off camera are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Jordy, our assistant coordinator. Um, and uh, members of the CTLT team, which is just uh, just the one today, would you like to introduce okay. yourself? Good morning, everybody. My name is Amy Crow. Uh, my Indigenous ancestry on Métis, uh, and I'm the strategist for Indigenous uh, initiatives here at the Center for Teaching and Technology. Good morning. Awesome. Um, yeah, so yeah, for those of you following along on Zoom, if you feel so inclined, please introduce yourselves in the chat box. We're still monitoring that um, to make sure that uh, to make sure that we get all the questions. Um, so to kick off the circle in earnest, I thought we'd start with a brief introduction of our speaker today. Um, Hazel Belkowski is a self-directed, steadfast woman of mixed Anishinaabe, yeah, Anishinaabe, yeah, Anishinaabe, Finnish, Irish, and English heritage. She holds a BFA in Film Studies from Ryerson University and has maintained a multidisciplinary arts practice for over 20 years, including public exhibits, facilitation of intergenerational community storytelling, and art-making circles. Um, she also has professional experience as a multidisciplinary artist and uh, a creative facilitator and event coordinator. She has extensive experience in working with diverse intergenerational communities, giving her the capacity and awareness required to create and hold spaces of belonging and safety for groups of people uh, inviting at levels of creative confidence, inviting levels of creative confidence into a creative process. Um, so with that, uh, I'll pass the mic over to you. Let's uh, let's get started, Hazel. Thank you, Cole. Bonjour, Indigenous Hazel Belkowski. Um, thank you so much for having me in the circle, and having me like in the bigger circle. <laughs> um, just like to acknowledge that we are here on this beautiful territory, the Musqueam. And it's actually the place I grew up. I grew up over in family housing. It wasn't part of UBC, so we were able to live there for 20 years. And so I just want to acknowledge that I got to grow up here on this peninsula that juts out into the, the Salish Sea and to, um, to locate us here at the mouth of the Fraser. And um, let's start by, um, if you feel comfortable, um, closing our eyes. Yeah, and grounding, putting both our feet on the floor. And for you at home too, please um, close your eyes, put your feet on the floor if you feel safe. If you don't, um, just have a soft gaze on the ground and if you take a deep breath in and out. We'll take two more breaths. We'll just think about this place where we're in, uh, in the Musqueam, we're the stewards of this place. And think about um, maybe some of the trees you saw on the way here. Breathe in and out. And, and how did the, the air feel on your skin today? Did you hear the birds calling as you, as you walked out your door and you made your way here?
Yeah, we're here in the land of eagles and cedars, um, slugs and salal, and salmon berries and sword ferns, and moss, all types of moss and lichens, and broadleaf maples. And bears would have called this place home and um, skunks and deer and coyotes. And now take one more breath in. And, and go to the place that you love in nature. The place, maybe it's the place you grew up. Maybe it's um, somewhere that you go to often. Maybe it's somewhere you've never been. What are the details of that place? What does it smell like? What does it feel like to be there? How does your spirit feel when you get there or you think of it? Great, and now one more breath in. And exhale, and wiggle your toes and fingers. Come back into the room. And is it okay if people talk to themselves right now? Mm -hmm. Talk yeah, to each course, other? Of course. So now I'm going to take a moment and talk to the person beside you about that place that you love. Just tell a couple details. And for you at home, um, maybe write in, talk to the people. If you're with somebody, talk to them about it. And also write in some details about that place. Thank you so much for taking that risk and time to, to go to the place that you love, and to connect. Um, so so I, my name is Hazel, and I am a visual artist and a creative facilitator. And I work with an organization called Indigenize. And we use the creative arts and culture and land-based learning to um, raise up, engage, inspire youth throughout BC. We do that in the summertime. We do it throughout the year and then we also work with adults mainly throughout the year. The heart of our program is in the summer and it's um, these eight day camps out on the land with like 40 youth, maybe, maybe more sometimes and, and, and sometimes less. And they're, they're quite profound. That's, they're, they're wild and um, life, life changing. And I came to this work, it was in 2006, and I was living in downtown Toronto, and I um, was living an amazing life. I was uh, an artist showing in galleries, I was like going to parties, drinking tequila and espresso, and like, what, could, what more could you want? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and there was something missing though, there was something there was a void. There was there was something I was hungry for that I couldn't name, um, and I kept my grandmother, my dad's mother, um, Catherine, Kathy Koski. Um, she is Anishinaabe, and her mother's Anishinaabe from Northern Ontario, from Thunder Bay, and she kept coming to my mind. She she passed when I was fairly young, and um, so I. I sort of called myself to action. I, I thought I need to go to the lands where she comes from, and it was all. I was also spurred on by um, hearing about Grassy Narrows on CBC that summer. And at that point, Grassy Narrows had had the longest Indigenous logging road blockade. And I sort of was like, "What the? Like, why isn't this front page news? How can this go on and be something that nobody knows about, or very few people, a small group?" Of so I started researching it, and then it took me, I ended up going north to Grassy Narrows. And, um, as I was there, and I was meeting folks, and I was on the, on the blockade, I was wondering, like, what am I doing here? What is this all about? And I, I, at the, I was panicking a bit, because I was going to be, I was there off-season, like, I was there in the summer, and the logging road 
nobody was there on it. So the end, the women who who met me and brought me there were like going to be there for one day with me, and then they were like, "Okay, see so yeah, you. You can stay as long as you want." I was like, "I I don't know what I'm doing here," and I lay down on the ground, and I heard the land speak to me, and it said, "You're you're just here to be. You don't need to do anything. You're just here to be on the land." And so the land speaks to us, when, when, even if we can't hear it, it's speaking to us. And um, something that I recently, recently got sent to me from my, one of my colleagues with indigenized, Tim Emmanuel, he sent me a, a piece of writing of, by um, Crazy Horse, and that we are, we are owned by the land. The land owns us. We don't own the land. And um, you know, we belong here. And, and that's what the camps are about, is about in, like, um, creating space for these, for these young people to, to learn, or creating space for them to potentially know that they belong. And, um, and it's through the arts, and it's through facilitators, and it's through teachings, through games, through being on the land, through, like, in the summertime, we had an amazing camp on the banks of the Smokeweed River. In Headley, and it was like scorching hot out. It was like we would have gone insane if we weren't right beside the river. It was so hot, and um, you know it's. And we were in Snake Country, so we got to learn the teaching of walking with a stick, because the the three leggeds and the four leggeds have treaties with the snakes, but the two leggeds not so much. So you're supposed to walk with a big snake big stick, and um, you know, for me as a facilitator, it's life tr transforming to be out there for, for eight days and to be with 50 people. We sort of do like um, half youth, half adults, that's the ideal, that there's two youth per adult. So it's, um, and we, do, we play tons of games and we make lots of art and we use the creative arts to engage, sometimes it's hip hop. It depends on what the facilitators um, bring. Like sometimes we have hip hop and dance and spoken word and poetry and the visual arts. There's an art barn, so we set up this tent with all this art. This year, the art barn was like 20 feet from the river, and so we'd make things, and then you'd be like, "Oh, I'm so hot," and you go get in the river. And um, while we're out there, you know, stuff happens, storms, um, and it, it's that being out there. It's like having the, the wind, the heat, the sun on your skin, and um, getting connected. It's so important. It's so important in, the, in this. Uh, there's been, I don't know how many things that have been put in place for us to be separated from our mother, from from where we grow out of, from from the earth. And um, so when people get on the land, they recalibrate, they recover, they rejuvenate, and it and it's you don't really have to do anything. You don't have to do much. I was listening to a poet speaking and he said, I go among trees and I sit still. And I reflect on myself, like so often I go among trees but I don't sit still. Like I walk pretty fast, like I walk because I'm walking my dog. And I, um, so I've started a practice, one of the practices we do at camp is a spirit spot. And it's, um, you go out on the land and you sit for a, t for a time. We, we, ideally, it would be like half an hour. But maybe we get five minutes. <laughs> and it, from the youth, like we, we had a camp this summer in State Illis, and it was like hurting, it was like, I don't know, hurting gophers or trying to keep the youth in their sit spots. <laughs> like, and then that doesn't become very much fun. And you're like, get in your sit spots. And that's not the point. It's, there was some who were ready and some who were not. 
Are there any questions? Do we so want to have, have some questions, questions about the, the camps and, and generally your experience in terms of um, watching youth as, as, as somebody that kind of gets to be a part of that process, which, which can be really beautiful. I'm sure that we all have personal experiences about you know, regarding that sort of thing. But what would you say for the youth that, that are, are old enough perhaps or, or, or that, that, um, that engage in the teachings that are there? What would you say uh, is the biggest kind of change? Do you see a change in them? Like, do they become, you know, do they become a little bit more still, maybe, or, or like, what is your experience with that? Well, you see, um, it's hard to say. We've had have these youth that have been coming for we're now in our fifth year of camps, and they keep coming back. That's something right there, right? They keep coming back and. Um, some of them are a little bit challenging, but they, you see them, so when, first when they come, a lot of them are like pretty shy, they're like, we get like a circle of 40 youth like this, right, <laughs> on the first day, and then by the end, they're like this, or they're standing up and they're, they're mm -hmm. doing spoken word poetry at the open mic, um, okay, one youth. Um, he, he comes to camp, I've been at camp with him twice, he's fairly nonverbal, he, um, he's really, you're, he's really watching and aware of everything, but you might make an assumption that he's a little bit slow, and that he's not paying attention, and that he's not engaged, and meanwhile, and he doesn't really, ha he doesn't really interact with anybody. Um, and this, this past summer, he started to interact. Well, actually, we were playing a game. The first time I saw him, we were playing a game, and I'm not, I never can remember the name of this game, but it's called, like, it's about these two nations coming together, sort of a, describing um, colonization, or the two different cultures coming together. And so it's very simple. There's the one culture that comes, that shakes hands, and they greet they have a knife, they carry a knife, and they're all about like making profit and money and reason. And then there's this other one that the head of the the head of the group is a woman. She's the eldest woman. Um, they they look away as a sign of respect, and they are connected to land. And so then these are the these are the basic rules of getting missing some of them, and then. You come together as two groups, and you quickly see, like, and they will protect the, the eldest woman to the death. And so you, within five minutes, there's chaos because, like, and I was the eldest woman. Like, I played, I was playing one of the games. Right. I was the eldest woman. And um, this youth, he was on my team. And like until this point, I hadn't seen him like move faster than like a pretty slow walk, and so he, he has to protect me because like within two minutes, there's chaos, and the that other group of people want to like kill me, and he, you can't even believe how fast he moves. He is everywhere, like all over the place, protecting me because like he would really paid attention, and he. Um, He's focused and he's like so um, so full of empathy and he he just like I was like oh my gosh wow like mm -hmm. this and so that was the first year I saw him which was two years ago and then this past summer in Staelis he came and I noticed that he likes to talk at night he doesn't the day isn't his time and I had brought with me uh, this little raven puppet named Ember, and he grabbed the puppet. Or at one, one of the days, there was one youth who had the puppet who loved to do funny voices, and then somehow the puppet made it to, um, to Dylan. And over the next five days, Dylan used this puppet to talk to people, to interact with the other students. And, mm -hmm. And by the end of that camp, he made friends with two other youth. Mm. And it was, so it was like the combination of um, 
the creative arts, the playing, the being right on the river, mm -hmm. the going swimming every day. Yeah. yeah. There's something inherently soothing about being on the land, right? About being in, in territory, at least I, I find it that to be the case. I always feel um, instantly more relaxed as soon as I'm in uh, spaces of nature. Uh, we were talking about Pacific Spirit Park and how much of a sanctuary it is. For those of you that don't know, Vancouver is a very big, <laughs> big, big um, city. And then just next to the university here, there's a large kind of uh, wooded park, I guess that would be the best way to describe it for everybody around here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting as soon as you go in there, the change that can be, mm. that, can, that can happen to people. How long have you been with the camp again? I started, I went to my first camp. I started working with or taking the trainings of Indigenous in, in the fall of 2015. Mm -hmm. And I went, that first time I met Dylan at the first camp, we were in, um, we were up in the Smokamine Valley, we were in, on the powwow grounds, we were also on a river, not the Smokamine, a different river. It was also very hot. Um, yeah, so since 2016, going to camps. And the specific location of the camp, that changes year to year? Changes year to year. Is that done purposefully? Um, it, no. Not really? I think <laughs> more like logistically, like, yeah. at, like timing wise or, um, yeah, logistically. Mm -hmm. This year actually we are going to do it again in the same place we did it last year because we loved it so mm -hmm. much. There you go. We did it on Headley, and it, um, one of the founders of Indigenized, Kelly Trebasket, her auntie's land. Cool. Yeah. Very and cool. it's the sand, sand beach right on the edge of a river. And it's um, very dusty. It was very dusty. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> prick, prickly, I think. You know, because it's desert. And, and, but one of the games we did, or it was more of a team building, so... At the camps, we break into family groups, and that's a way of keeping track of youth and having more intimate time. And so there's usually two to three facilitators with a group of like six to eight youth. And you, you develop a name and a call and a, and a sign, and, and you meet every day and you check in every day. And it's, this is also a way of like keeping track. So like when we gather at meals, like look around and see your family group. And um, one of the one of the tasks this year was we had the river and we had to get across the river without getting well. We the ideally it was without getting wet, but they gave us a piece of paper. And we had to write stuff on it, write our mission or something, and then we had to get this piece of paper across the river without getting it wet. And we had to take our lunch and our and our clothes with us because we were going to go cross the river and then for a hike and then we we're going to hang out at this other beach down the river for okay. the day. And so that was that was the mission. And we all made it across. There was some poison ivy um, like in the whole group there was yeah. always something you have to be prepared that something unexpected, maybe terrible, um, uncomfortable is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So some our paper for sure got wet like immediately. <laughs> in my family group, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the the youth put it in his pocket of his shorts. <laughs> Lesson learned, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he was getting really yelled at by all the other people, the young women in the group. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I got it." And he put it in his pocket. And then <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, but we all made it across, and only one person had got poison ivy pretty bad. And, but then we had this amazing day down at this beach that has these huge rocks that you could climb on and you, you get in the, the current of the river, mm -hmm. it takes you down, like, and then you go back up and down, yeah. Great. That's cool. Very cool. Um, I'd like to take a step back a little bit from mm. the camps and, and talk a little bit about yourself and your personal journey and, and kind of growing up, what the connection, what a connection to the land meant to you. Um, or, or if, you know, if growing up you were maybe divorced from that connection, what that reconnection meant to you. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of a, a free-form question, however you'd like to answer it. Thanks, cool. Um, well, luckily I have a mother who made sure I was connected mm -hmm. to the forest. 
Um, and so I, I said I, I grew up over here, little army huts. Um, they, they've been torn down since. And mm -hmm. So I, w and I went to elementary school in U Hill, mm -hmm. so I could get to school through the trails. And then also I was um, born and conceived and spent the first couple of years of my life on Sunshine Coast. And so my mom always would bring me back there. Mm -hmm. And and then also I had I was brought to Ontario a lot because both my parents are from Ontario, and she would bring me to Muskoka to a lake, and so I had a fairly keen, a fairly strong connection mm -hmm. to the land, and it's always been, it feels like it's central, mm -hmm. um, and that's a blessing and that's a privilege, and I, I'm really grateful for it. I. I did go and live in Toronto, downtown Toronto, for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And um, but my connection has been so strong that I was able to seek out wild spaces. And it actually wasn't until 2006 when I, you know, I was, I guess I had been disconnected. And then 2006, what I was missing was that connection with Mm -hmm. To land, and the other the other main piece that I was missing was a connection to ceremony and ritual, and sitting in circle like this, and um, a way of expressing gratitude mm -hmm. for my connection to land, yeah. and a, a way of like, oh, I can just like talk to the nature, like I can just say prayers, I can just um, speak directly to the Great Spirit, like I I don't. I didn't grow up with um, any formal spirituality or religion, or mm -hmm. so the main piece was that a real, real thirst. And I remember, so I went to Grassy Narrows, and then that led me to join across Canada a speaking awareness tour about Grassy Narrows. So I went with elders and youth, and a man named David Soen from Rainforest Action Network, and we drove um, starting in February from. Kenora, from north of Kenora, so through the snow, we went to Regina and Saskatoon, and we ended up, I was two months long, and we ended up in, down in Seattle. And it was on that trip where I remember sitting in my first circle with an elder. Mm -hmm. It was at the University of Regina. The people who had held, put us up, billeted us in their house, they are like, you should go to that morning circle with that elder. Mm -hmm. And so we went, and um, she got out the smudge bowl, and she got out the feather, and she smudged us, and and then she passed that feather around. And as soon as I got the feather in my hand, I just like waterworks. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was that like a deep, deep hunger for culture, and mm -hmm. and and. Like simple technology, it's simple technology that that is in all indigenous cultures that all of our ancestors used. Yeah. The technology that connects us to land, right? Because that technology grows out of the land, no matter where it comes from on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. The language grows, the culture grows, the artwork comes from the land. Um, yeah, so for me, learning how to interact with the land in that ceremonial, spiritual way. Yeah. Thank you for that question, because that helped me make that link. Yeah, I was going to add, that was going to be a follow-up question is, um, do you incorporate any of those aspects into the youth camp? Or, uh, and if you, if you do or if you don't, what do you think, um, is that what, youth they are missing as we kind of move forward into the modern age and we digitize a lot of things. Uh, I know myself personally, I can speak for my own family, our, you know, our youth become more and more entrenched in these online spaces. And I'm not saying that that's a negative thing per se, I'm not an expert in, in youth psychology, but to me, as, it, as somebody that maybe belongs in an older generation perhaps, connection to land as it is part of uh, indigenous culture, as it's interwoven within ceremony, it's kind of, it, it's integral to the way that, that communities and that we they live our lives. 
Um, so as we kind of, what, what are your thoughts on that, I guess, kind of as we move forward into the modernization and digitization of, uh, of our lives, do you think there'll be something that we miss there? You know, even if we keep the, the, the cultural practices, you know, word for word intact as they are now, without the land component, do you think there's something missing? Mm-hmm. As you're speaking, as I'm listening to you, um, that the camps work so well because we have like three components happening and it's mm -hmm. like the creative arts, um, the play, like maybe it's more than, it's like hanging out together on the land, playing, having ceremony, ta at least talking about it we, and doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, what was the other? Land, ceremony, culture, play, maybe it's like four. But it's um, one of the things that um, Kim Hacks did, one of the other co-founders of Indigenous, who I believe she was here at the Learning Circles. She said, it's, um, like, when did you learn, or when did you forget to dance? When did you forget to sing? When did you forget to make things? When did you stop connecting with land? What's the fifth one, Kim? She's not here. <laughs> but it's like all of our indigenous cultures had these five things. Mm -hmm. Dancing, singing, making, ceremony, and nature. Mm -hmm. And I think they're essential. Like, I, so before indigenized, I worked um, with the Toronto District School Board, and I got to work with these 30 youth, native and non-native. And we did this um, theater program. And we had three months together, and we were going to design uh, we had to make a one-hour theater piece, and we had youth who were like on house arrest, 19 years old, having a really hard time graduating from school, and then we had like theater uh, theater kids who were like really excited. So we brought these two groups of people together to make this theater piece, and we're in downtown Toronto. And as I was thinking about this earlier this morning, we didn't do a lot of nature connection. I did bring them outside, but what we did do every day was sit in a circle, smudge, pass a talking stone around, and um, what I saw in these youth that have been like really close, they were having like some serious challenges at home and in school and in their lives, and so that um, that connection to simple ancient technologies of, of ceremony and sitting in a circle and, and smudging, like cleansing, and then getting the chance to speak um, was profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah for, for, the, for the youth. Yeah. For the youth. They, were, they became like this motley crew to like just this big, wide open, like creative geniuses. With, with a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so at this point, I would like to invite any questions. Amy, would you like to, to maybe take, we'll take a second, and if you have any questions, you can chat with Amy a little bit about it. We're going to take a, a few minutes here. and um, So in the online space, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so I, I'd invite some conversation about what we talked about recently. And, and, yeah. um, and uh, Okay, we have a um, we have a, a point from the online audience. Um, storytelling is the fifth bomb that Kim has some thoughts about. <laughs> um, the five universal elements of culture are singing, dancing, storytelling, prayer, meditation, ceremony, any of those things, um, and connecting with nature. So storytelling is profound. Um, Thank you. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, and, I, and I'm glad you brought that up. I think that... Um, Storytelling in particular is so central to so many cultures, mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously to ours as well. But um, do you engage in any, in any of those? Like those are kind of wrapped up into the the arts component of the camps, I guess, right? Um, the act of creating stories and um, or conversely telling old stories, right? Um, what is your experience when exposing youth to that sort of thing? Do you know what I mean? Like giving them that opportunity to express themselves through story. Um, or through dance, um, mm -hmm. particularly uh, as it relates to the, to the camp uh, mm -hmm. with indigenous, with these indigenous youth that maybe are a little bit drawn, withdrawn, or are struggling in one way or another. Would you, could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I 
can't believe I forgot storytelling because it is <laughs> one of the central things and one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, we at the camps we tell the four food chief story. Four food chief story is an Okanagan silks traditional ancient story, and we we've been telling that one over and over again. So um, it's good for me too because I'm starting to like embody it and, mm -hmm. and and know it, and you learn about um, the bear and. Sia, the, the Saskatoon berry, and the, the bitter root, and the salmon. And so we hear the story over and over again, and I think we start to embody it. We start to embody the wisdom, the deeper mm. layers of wisdom that's in it about the medicine of those plants. And, um, and then in, um, so I'm an Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, and I found a story recently that is that really reminds me of the Four Food Chief. It's sort of a similar story about um, the animals, because so in the Four Food Chief story, the animals, uh, great creator, is like tells these guys, the Four Food Chiefs, that um, the human is coming, and that they're gonna they're gonna be pitiful, and they're gonna need to be fed and taken care of. Mm. And so these these Four Food Chiefs get together and discuss what they're gonna do, mm. and they offer the the bear is the chief of the four food chiefs and he's they suggest that they're going to offer he's going to offer himself mm -hmm. and the rest of them agree they're like okay we'll support these guys who are coming yeah, Fair enough. yeah. i'm glad um, that you brought up that component of traditional medicines um, because i think that that's uh, something that we talk a lot about at the learning circle uh, we have several sessions on on, on not just utilizing traditional medicines, but the act of harvesting those traditional medicines and why that's important and, and, and kind of a critical step in connecting to land and to culture and, and understanding where you come from. Um, so I know it's difficult, obviously, in summer camps because you have, you have youth that are from you know, a wide variety of backgrounds and come from di different territories, but do you try to engage in any of those kind of traditional practices, like, like the harvesting of traditional medicines, particularly the territory that you're situated on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We we often have elders come. We had an elder come, and he knew all the plants. And I remember mm -hmm. that he had little uh, leaves or little pieces of them, and he was telling us about them mm -hmm. at the first camp I was at. And it was like just this wealth of knowledge. Um, and then we have um, one of our facilitators this past summer on Headley, Billy Kruger, mm -hmm. and she's a. a she makes medicine, salves, um, ointments, tinctures, mm -hmm. and so she ran a workshop, and we went out and picked some stuff. And no, I think we just made a salve with some of the stuff she had. Yeah, and it depends on who the facilities are and what they know, and they take us out, and we'll do. We'll do we do tons of activities on the land, and some of them is foraging or getting mm -hmm. to know the plants. And, um, so again, for the, uh, the live audience, you're more than welcome to have a question at any time. But we have another one from the online audience. Um, Aaron uh, asks, what are some of the ways that you embed the ceremonial practices at the camp into the youth's lives when they go back to their communities or when they go back? Are there, are there steps or things that you do to kind of see if the youth can take those teachings with them when they go? Um, Thank you. That's a good question. That's a question that we're always uh, wrestling with. It's a tough one, right? It's a tough one because yeah. you, um, it's just consistency, I think. And we feel like once a year isn't maybe consistent enough, but um, we can't really send home. Like we, we can share the teachings and do the teachings, but um, some of them are coming from traditional backgrounds, some of them are not. Some of them are coming from the city, some of them, a lot of them are coming from foster care. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes you have an opportunity. At, I was able, I love gifting. It's one of the things I love to do. Mm -hmm. And um, at one of the camps this summer, um, one young man really, really responded to the smudge and the feather. And so I gifted him with the, the smudge bowl and the feather and some sage. And he took that home with him. And then I had a drum and there was this one Actually, it was his sister. She was like drumming all week long, and, and, and 
stay in the fire and wait and be there just drumming. Like, and she's just like, she's like, the only reason I'm here is drumming. Otherwise, I'd go home. I can't remember her saying that. And, yeah. and she had her 13th birthday when she was at camp. Maybe it was 13 or 16. I think it was 13. And so I gifted her the drum. Mm -hmm. So both those youth went home or something. But there's 40 of them. So you, but I think just the community that we're building over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those connections between them, them so, like the youth themselves. Yeah. yeah. And seeing us do, do it. And, um, we may not do it enough at camp. Mm -hmm. We get caught up in the playing and the. Arts and crafts, and and also the workshops out on the land. And mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's something you brought up there. I think is really important um, when you talked about modeling and mentorship. And I think that that is is crucial when we're talking about working with youth and particularly connecting to land. I know that it's difficult to do so, especially like for those of us here in the, in the live audience, and for myself. You know, I live a couple blocks from here. Natural space, and it's difficult to to connect to to the land and get outside and, and just be be with the territory. But um, but I think if we're talking about building up the importance of the next generation and their relationship to the land, I think it has to come from from us as, as their parents or uncles, aunties or cousins, um, and uh, and their relation and our relationship to the land. Sorry, um, because you you learn from what they see, right? Is that your personal experience as well? Yeah, from my model. I, yeah, yeah, just in general. Yeah, definitely modeling and mentoring it and yeah. like showing up, showing up with your two feet and you're like mm -hmm. smudging and, and talking about your own personal experience. And that's really important. Uh, the storytelling, those personal storytelling. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, that there's we can connect to nature in the city, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's wildness here in the city. There's crows and coyotes and skunks, and um, there's the beach not so far away, and there's trees. And, um, so when I return to Toronto, after like finding a little bit of ceremony and finding a little bit more confidence in myself by connecting to land, to elders and be, I, I started like physically taking myself so there's a big park in Toronto called High Park and there's a beautiful lake Lake Ontario it's massive and so I started to take myself regularly daily I, I needed to go to these wild wilder spaces I needed to be among green I needed to be with the water and like no kidding like every time I went I would I was greeted by something extraordinary, like a hawk eating a squirrel, or um, like wild geese flying, or you know, just wild things would show up and say hello. Yeah. Um, as you transitioned back into the city, you mentioned needing to go out there. Was that like for for mental or for emotional health? Did it make you feel like how did it make you feel? I guess is my question. Yeah, yeah, it would be mental and emotional health, and. Um, it was just like that call, like that pull, uh, and, a, and a space to go and, and have a little ceremony and have gratitude and acknowledge the water spirits that are there and the earth spirits and acknowledge all those rivers that are covered up in our cities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a, a neat, it was a daily mental health practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was a practice that would sustain me. Maybe we could take a minute if there are any questions from the audience here, yeah. the face to face audience, and just see if the conversation uh, can spark from here. Does anyone have any questions or ideas or things to um, contribute as we're listening to the amazing sharing that's happening so far? Thank you. Just kind of processing so much of this, um, I I'm thinking about the 
Oops a Goop, and the amazing story from the curl puppet and the drum and what they take away with them. Um, I got to hear Dr. Natalie Clark speak last night, and uh, one of the things she was talking about um, was kind of a decolonizing consent event, and one of the things she was talking about is kind of healing violations of consent. Indigenous people, the violations of consent are personal, interpersonal, societal, intergenerational. And she talks about the healing power of reconnecting with our bodies, yes, mm -hmm. with our desire, when our consent has been violated so many times. Mm -hmm. And so when you were describing these youth to me, that's what kept kind of flashing up, is these moments of these youth connecting with what they really wanted to say yes to, like with their own, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that and bringing that up because they do show up with so many levels of violation and disconnection, carrying all the intergenerational stuff. And, and so it's just about like us being there together. And like so the model that we use um, with Indigenize is we bring together the rediscovery land based model from Haida Gwaii and then we bring. The creative community model, which comes out of um, Washington, from maybe you've heard of the Power of Hope camps, and there there are these creative art camps that go eight days, and they use the creative arts, and they're a really fast-paced camp. It's like um, one activity to the next activity to the next activity. It's like when you get out of the eight days, you're like, oh my god, they're really really fun. But so that indigenous emerges these two models, and we're still figuring out. Like, because I found that the I love the power of camps, but I feel a bit oppressed by the timing. Um, and so we're, you need the spaciousness for magic to happen. Spaciousness, um, yeah, for that medicine to come. Um, one story that's coming to mind is we had we had this. Um, it was young activists, like older youth camp. It's like 18 to 24. It was at Glimpse, Glimpse Lake up in Upper Nicola Valley. I believe that's where it was, up in the Okanagan. And um, we, we had a youth come who had selective mutism. So he wasn't, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He talked to his sister a little bit. And if you went up to talk to him, he would get really visibly anxious and um, couldn't look at you. And, and so we would just held the space for him over the week. You know, we'd be in circle talking, and you know, it would come to him, and we, we wouldn't, we just hold it as a community. Because that's what this model allows, is we, we sort of scaffold risk taking. So we start out really low risk really low risk stuff and then we sort of add in things and we're really consistent to like encouragement and raising each other up and strength based language and, and so we just hold that space over the week and um, he was after a while he started to be able to say things and then um, the most profound moment was in our closing circle maybe it was the last night we were all in this little cabin, it was like like really squished circle right around the edge of the room so that we could all fit. And he hadn't said more than a couple words in the bigger circles. He had started to speak one on one with some of the facilitators and um, Kim Haxton was leading that camp and she passed around this beautiful rose quartz stone. And she asked the question, how do you perceive love and how do you receive love? And this is after being together. This was a more cultural camp. We did, we did um, a sit out on the land. We did um, two sweats. We, um, we really talked about, um, uh, we did food sovereignty and um, self-governance. It was a little bit more political. It was a little bit more, we did a lot around gender because um, the youth were older, so we talked gender and um, one of my colleagues, Alan Lin Thomas Lindley, they are this fierce warrior for um, two-spirit and non-binary and gender neutral and bringing that, 
transit because of residential schools and various other things. That knowledge got lost. But they, um, they've been learning about it for 14 years and has, have found the language and found that, you know, that there's, you know, in some cultures there's five genders. And it, um, they told me that, he said he couldn't remember the nation, but in the East, he said maybe it's Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, that there's 12 genders. It's like a spectrum. Um, so anyways, we were in this circle, and that stone comes to this one youth, and he just bursts into tears, and we all burst into tears, and then he speaks from the heart. And he and his sister were in foster care. They came from the city, and this is their actual home territory, so this was their first time coming home. And so that camp, sort of all of our favorite. We just love that camp when we talk about the camps and remember that camp. And, and it was partly because of him and his, his connection to the land and his sister and him opening up. The way we got to see that how our community created a space that allowed him space to, to feel comfortable and seen and heard. Yeah. Thank you. We have, a, we have a question, actually, from, from the online audience. Neil asks, um, uh, is a little bit concerned about the water and swim. He has, do you have someone with a life saving certificate? We have lifeguards. Um, and then he asks, who cooks? There's three big, three big meals. Do you guys engage in like a community model where the kids, or the youth, sorry, all contribute to the food, or how does that work? Um, thank you, Neil, for your concern about the swimming. We have lifeguards. <laughs> we have a lifeguard usually on site and hopefully other people with, well, we have other people with first aid. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do the camp without that. Um, the cooking is we often hire um, elders from the community who, that's part of their job. They do catering. We, have, we do that. We work with the communities we're in or near. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, the, yeah. We participate by doing the dishes. So the different family groups will be responsible for a different um, dishwashing session. We probably have to do them more. That is also a huge community builder, like mm -hmm. doing work together. It is, like, it is essential. I love doing work together. So <laughs> usually there's like cleaning the porta potties, cleaning the, cleaning the land up, doing the dishes. There's other jobs, like there's, it's better if we have more jobs. Like, um, so this summer we were in Staelis, which we were in this lodge, we had bedrooms, we had cooks, we had dishwashers, and it really disconnected, like, I, I, would, I would suggest that we never do it in a lodge again. Mm -hmm. It's really luxurious, um, and it's fun, there's lots of different rooms and spaces, but that was also like terrifying because the kids were just like, disappearing everywhere. But then Headley was just awesome because we were just outside for eight days and we had to do jobs. We couldn't, sometimes we have a firewood team and a fire keeping team, but there was no fires this summer. So, because we were, there were forest fires. We were actually in a valley and there was forest fires on both ends of the valley. Oh, and that's a good story. There's this, we had an elder who's the fire was coming really close to his house, this house he grew up in. And um, he got a call saying, it's getting really close, you, you might have to evacuate, you will, and like dangerously close. And he was with us at that camp, and it was an evening time. And so we, we got up and we made a big circle and we spoke about what's happening and we sung a song together. We sung a song and we did a, a, a hugging circle, like a greeting circle where you go around and give a hug and then you receive a hug. So it can be a long circle that circles in on itself. And we sung, and we prayed, and then we got word in the morning that the fire started going the other way. So that, that was a really powerful moment for us at camp this summer.
Are there any other questions or comments? Any thoughts from the live audience? I have a question, if anyone anyone else does. I know, I work with faculty at UBC a lot, and I know that a lot of them are looking for ways to get students out of the classroom, but have the limitations of a 90-minute period or something that mm-hmm. we have that space. Are there things, you've mentioned a few really good examples that I want to carry forward after this workshop, but are there things that are top of mind for you that faculty can do in their classes that might get students thinking and processing in some of the ways that you've mentioned, even though it's a shorter period of time? Maybe just beginning by going outside mm-hmm. and doing, you know, I don't, like, do, do you do circles like this in, in I know we came here and we did, um, we did the cultural safety workshops and stuff, and we would like mix up the tables and get everybody in a circle. And um, so you could like take everybody outside and do a circle. It's the activities, yeah, like because there's so many activities, like just little short things of even as simple as going outside and like greeting a tree going and talking to a tree or oh this one I love this one is called I wonder and you go out and you have you're in partners and and all you can say is I wonder one partner goes for like two minutes and you're like I wonder I wonder where this stone came from I wonder what minerals are in this stone I wonder how long this stone has been here and so you just go like that and and then you trade and it gets you thinking about time, it gets you thinking about um, so many things that you wouldn't normally think. You just walk by, you're like, oh, that's a stone. And then there's the, there's the game, um, you greet a tree, which we play at camp a lot. One, you could just send people out to go and sit with the tree or, or go and find their tree if they feel called to a tree and sit with the tree and then ask the tree a question. So just, just start thinking... Um, that the these are these are people. They're the standing people, and um, the one we do at camp is with blindfolds, and you have a partner. Say Cole and I are partners, and he's blindfolded, and I will take him out and like walk him around in circles and walk him over this and under that, and like, and then I'll take him to a tree, and he has like five minutes to be with that tree. It's about intuition, so we really suggest you you connect in with that tree. And then you look for all the details, that's what I do. I'm like, are there long grass here? Is it like... And then I walk him back in a different way, back to the beginning. And then he takes his blindfold off, and then he has to go out and find that tree. Mm-hmm. And um, usually you find your tree. <laughs> when I first did it, Kim Haxton was leaning in, and him and said, you will find your tree. And you know, you're panicking, you're right here, I'm not going to find my tree, I'm not going to find my tree, I'm not. And I was like, wait a minute, Kim just told me, I'm going to find my tree. Mm-hmm. I found my tree. Mm-hmm. And, and, and my partner, he didn't find his tree that first time, but um, it just allows for, like, then he had this personal crisis about not seeing what's right in front of him. So that was a teaching. But we do this with the youth. Yeah, t- some of them talk about, like, they just stopped, and they listened to their heart and their intuition, and they went directly to their tree. There's all these different stories. Thank you. There's so many little activities that can be done. It's just about going outside, I think. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Can I just kind of follow up on that one? Um, and just to ask if you would suggest, or <clears throat> do you think it's valuable? I have class of economic students, and I've been and integrate indigenous perspectives and so but this connection to the land because like you know I teach about colonization and you know there's a very personal side to it but there's a cult and you know obviously what you've been talking about cultural side is there a resource that you would recommend that would be something to share with the students to provide some sense of what that is from a obviously it's going to be different for different people in terms of experience but just a, maybe a resource to, to share. I mean, it sounds like maybe, I don't know, that would be something you would have to... 
a resource to learn about? Well, just to, to be something written or spoken, whether it's a poem or or something that I could share with my class um, about um, the, 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 the importance of land mm -hmm. to indigenous culture. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I brought to this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, with me. This book is like a, a Bible. This is by um, Robin Wall Kimner, she's Potawatomi. And it's indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and teachings of plants. She's a biologist. And so she's bringing the scientific knowledge, but also bringing this deep uh, cultural indigenous knowledge. And then this other book, uh, Richard Wagamese, he's one of my favorites. He's a Ojibwe writer, Anishinaabe. He's at Ancestor now. Um, this is a good one, too. There's, there's so many good uh, like novels and also nonfiction. Richard writes po poems. There's um, Islands of De... Is it Islands of Decolonization? Decolonial Love. Decolonial Love. Islands of Decolonial Love. Thank <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And going to visit the Museum of Anthropology There's tons of resources to connect with the story and, and like in more like uh, gentle ways you can learn about the history of these territories. And the, this one, Braiding Sweetgrass, is like just this real sweet prayer, gentle, like sort of opening up your awareness to, to gratitude, to what she calls the, the literacy of animacy or like that pro like we need to broaden our idea about um, pronouns like that you know the tree people in the indigenous languages it wouldn't be and call it 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 would it would be a, a living being a relative Do you want it? We have a question from the online audience. Um, Shelly asks, what is a gift that nature has given you that you carry into your day-to-day -day living, kind of regardless of where you are? Um, and she just wanted to thank you very much for being here and doing this. Thank you. What's her name? Shelly. Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. Um, the gift, I, I'm so grateful to be on this planet. I. For a long time, I thought I loved the universe, which I do. I love the universe. But I love planet Earth. It is so wildly diverse. Um, it's hilarious. It's risk-taking. It's uh, just like brilliant, like beautiful, beautiful. Um, and so on a day-to-day, -day, I, I recently moved to this little cabin that's in the woods. It's right on a creek beside a 500-year-old yew tree. And I, so it's like right there. I just, it's, I walk out and I, I'm deeply full of gratitude. I just, for, for a while, my prayer was, thank you, thank you, thank you, miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. And, you know, so, uh, often I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, God, I got to do my to-do list. And I got to write those emails. I got to write that report. And then I'm like quickly reminded that just going outside first and, Having thanks. Mm -hmm. Does that answer it? I, yeah, yeah, I think so. Thanks very much for your. The question. green. I love being in the green. Like you talked about the relief of, yeah. of walking into the forest, like walking down one of the paths in specific spirit, and it's just this like, and we need that. We need that. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be surrounded by that, and we need to walk in those ways, right? Um, I was listening to. Uh, John O'Donohue, and he's a, he was a modern mystic, an Irish man, and he's passed now, he's an ancestor, but he's really wonderful to listen to also to speak about the Irish landscape. And he talked about um, like the peasants and the indigenous, they would, they would walk like, and use their body in all different ways, whereas now we walk like down corridors 
and down sidewalks, and down food aisles. Whereas naturally our, our ancestors, all of our ancestors would have been like climbing over logs, walking around stones, walking through rivers, um, walking among trees, and so using their body in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, and many of our ancestors also were nomads and they, because they knew that they couldn't stay in one place so they would use all those resources. And so they moved around so that uh, it was a sustainable way of being. Mm-hmm. We've got really like, I think really stuck in our chairs, at our computers, in our boxes. Mm-hmm. And so like, it is essential for all of us to, to go outside and spend as much time outside as possible. Yeah. Whether, it's, whether it's like in a park in the city or communing with the crows or finding a forest nearby. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks. Katie. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I do have a question. It's kind of a, it's kind of half baked, so you might need to help me here. Sure. Um, <laughs> one of the things we do here at CTLT is we work with um, faculty members a lot, helping them think through, trying to think through those who wish to kind of embed indigenous perspectives into their courses. And a challenge that constantly, of course, always comes up is this issue of co-opting. The issue of, I don't want to uh, take on something and do something that I shouldn't be doing from a non-Indigenous um, person, doing something Indigenous who is untraditional or making a mistake with it. So I'm just curious how in the camps, um, because you mentioned you know, you have a real mix of um, kids who are there and youth who are there some indigenous, non-indigenous, and whatnot. And it sounds like they're all experiencing, as a group, the, the similar thing. So I'm wondering, does that come up at all in the camps, in terms of um, where the traditions come from and who has, um, you know, not to say somebody's not grounded in it, but I'll give you another example. My daughter, who's in grade two, and is learning a lot now with the new curriculum about First Nations, which is fantastic. And she came home one day with this great artwork and she said, Mommy, and she was showing me all about it and talking about all the different things that she had painted in this picture. And then she said, I want to be First Nations. Mm. Right? And so then I had to celebrate that she's learning all these things, but also have to tell her because we're not Indigenous, how you can't just be another culture. Mm. And trying to explain that to a seven-year-old is not easy. So I'm just curious whether those conversations come up with the youth in the camps, mm-hmm. from their different social locations and belonging. Mm-hmm. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Not half baked. So our indigenized camps are uh, all mainly native youth. Yeah, all native. We have tried a couple times. We've done a, a couple um, Power of Hope indigenized like reconciliation camps mm-hmm. and um, challenging, really challenging. Some really challenging stuff comes up because um, we also, people weren't told that that's what it was going to be so we had all these native youth show up and then there's some non-native youth and they weren't expecting that. Um, so really important to let everybody know what what's happening and, and we thought maybe our reconciliation camps would be better for an older age group, so people who are really working towards reconciliation and and know more of the politics and more know more of the like what a cultural appropriation and cultural like celebration is. And at the camps, we're really um, you, you really needed to know where the teaching's coming from. Like, where is the story coming from? Is it an Okanagan story? Is it an Anishinaabe story? Is it a Cree story? And then we always introduce the songs, like who, like why you have the song, where did you get the song, what nation it comes from, is it from your own nation? So, and that's also at Power of Hope too. Like you really recommended to not share anything unless you have a real relationship with it. And you can say where that teaching came from or when you were gifted it or, and then, what I would say to your daughter is that 
like you you have like indigenous ancestry from another land right like if you were to explore where your ancestors came from what were their practices what were their how did they connect to the land and um I am Anishinaabe, and the, the Anishinaabe ancestors have really strengthened me and allowed me to feel strong and confident. And, and now um, I get, I've, I'm part Finnish, and in April I'm going to Finland for my first time to go and explore my Finnish ancestry. Because I, I feel like that will make me stronger. And, and I have Irish, I've been to Ireland. That made me stronger to walk on the bones of my ancestors there um, and to learn some of their traditions and that they are people of the land too, you know. And um, Koski means small rocky rapids. So that's one of my last names and so I'm going to go to the small rocky rapids of Finland. And um, one of my elders, Diane Longboat, who's a Mohawk, Six Nations, and she runs, holds a, a lodge called the Lodge of the Great Thunder. And um, one of her teachings is, is she started the lodge because she was being called by spirit that she needed to start sharing her medicine to help people get strong. And um, she says, you can come to my lodge and you can get strong here. And then you need to go home to your homelands and speak with your ancestors and learn about your culture. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you have shared. Um, I guess the question that came to my mind when you mentioned the challenge um, of having uh, Native youth and non-Native youth together. I'm wondering if you take a particular approach to conflict and conflict transformation. I don't know if you uh, use a specific way of transforming conflict, if it's from the view of the needs that are not being met, or if it's from a different approach, or if it's more like uh, depending on the situation. Um, just like, what's the view uh, towards conflict, how it's defined and mm. worked through in the camps? Good question. It's, like, we haven't actually defined it, we don't have in place, like, I don't know, one strategy. It's for like this situation. Some of us are skilled in nonviolent communication. Some of us have restorative, um, like conflict resolution. Um, definitely, it's like sitting together with both groups of people and um, talking it out and listening. And um, sometimes it works well, and sometimes it doesn't work well. And it, I guess it's also like transforming the frame from like it's conflict to like it's an opportunity to, to learn more about each other and more about us, ourselves. Yeah. It would be good to have like one, this is how we're going to do it at the camp. It's, it's wild with the 16 year olds, the 13, 16 year olds. Um, we have like the cliques that form. We've had some like pretty big conflicts in this summer with um, different groups of youth, and they're they're just dealing with so many things these days. And their needs are they don't even know how to speak to their needs. They don't even know that they can ask for their needs to be met. That's just knowing that you have a need and that it could be met is like, because so many other needs are not being met ever. So it's kind of like a just wild, a wild time of like listening, being, being patient. Like mm -hmm. we I consider us like these Jedi, these Jedi peacekeepers, because we're like we got these like youth who are like telling these stories, and you're like I don't know who's telling the truth, and. But we just keep showing up. Like we don't lose it. We don't get mad at them. We don't hurt. The, you know, we're just like, oh, okay. Well, how can we solve this? And they don't see that modeled in many of their home life, or yeah. 
but it definitely all the tools you can have for conflict resolution, the better. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from the online audience. Um, uh, Moira asks, Are there, do you have any suggestions with marginalized youth that don't have access to funding? Um, so do your camps, I guess, the question really is, do your camps have a cost? And if so, are there ways that youth can access them if, you know, if they don't have access to band funding or, or any other sort of resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of our camps are fully funded for the youth, so they can come for free. Mm -hmm. And we have subsidies, um, and we also need some folks to pay. Yeah. But um, they, we have lots of scholarships available. Mm -hmm. It's just that, and sometimes like we promote our, our camps, but for whatever reason, not everybody is seeing them. So, you know, we, our registration is really low, and then we panic and we send out. You know, it's it's just so that this camp is happening. It's called Indigenize. Look us up. The camp, this coming camp is July fourteenth to the twenty first in Headley. And yeah. Yeah. If if the youth can't afford it, we we do get youth from care who come from the city and come from different places, Williams Lake, and um, there's lots of scholarships available. Thank you very much for the question, Mario. We'll be sure to provide some of those resources, the ways that you can get in touch and ask more questions, more yeah. specific questions about um, access and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Amy, live audience, is there any other questions before we wrap up? We're just kind of coming to the end of our time here. No, okay, we have one final question from the online audience. Um, Aaron asks, doesn't, when we're talking about Power of Hope in these reconciliation camps, Aaron asks, are there any plans in the future to host additional um, Power of Hope reconciliation camps um, for older youth and or adults or community <coughs> leaders? Like, is there anything on the docket, I guess? Um, there's nothing on the docket. I know there is, like, a willingness and an interest. Um, there was a reconciliation camp that we held that um, Power of Hope hosted us. We were in Souk on Vancouver Island. And the it's the access. So we didn't have any Indigenous youth show up. Me and Alan went for Indigenize <coughs> to represent Indigenize. And um, there was, they just didn't know us. So it's like the Indigenous parent, like the parents are going to, send their kids to people they don't know. Mm. So it's about really building relationships. We were disappointed. Um, it's just like, oh, the access. Like, right. It's harder for, for them to get to the, the camp. Mm -hmm. and the Power of Hope kids, they, they already know each other. They've been going to camp for years, and they, they all showed up. And mm -hmm. That's a really beautiful thing about that, that community, because they have this legacy of youth becoming facilitators and, yeah. and so that that is strong and powerful and it's a really and so then it's about us going to communities and meeting people and sharing what we do because you can explain to the cows come home that we play games and we make art mm -hmm. and we do these silly things and we like sparkle and snap when people say cool things mm -hmm. But it's not until you actually do it that you're like, yeah, okay, maybe I could do that. Mm -hmm. So we, we, there is more desire to do these reconciliation camps. Um, there is a need for it. Um, I think there's a big space, and it would probably be for older youth. So stay tuned, Aaron. <laughs> awesome. Um, so as long as there aren't any other questions from the live audience, I think we'll wrap up for today. Thank you very much, Hazel, for your time. I really appreciate it and the knowledge that you shared with us. Um, I, I feel like I got a lot out of it, so I really wow. appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and to the live audience, everyone, thank you all very much um, for contributing to the conversation or just being here in this space to, to listen and, 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 and to be with us. Mm -hmm. um, the Learning Circle, we're, we're a weekly show. We're here every single week, so next week we'll have uh, Melanie Rivers coming in to talk a little bit about uh, art therapy, um, and then following that, in the coming weeks, in February, we'll have sessions on functional medicine, um, traditional medicines and teas, um, and an awards session for anybody that's interested in that, uh, postgraduate student awards sort of thing. So 
And then um, there's another one with indigenized too. And there is another one Kim with indigenized. Haxton. Yeah. Uh, on an ally ship, right? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to just plug that session as well for those in the room, February 21st, 10 to 1130. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be back in that space at that time. Thank you very much, everybody in the online and the live audience for, for sticking with us. And um, yeah, have a great day.